So there has been a major development in the UK human rights sphere, specifically relating to ongoing attacks on the rights of trans people, something I've discussed and revisited in the past. For those who don't know, a group consisting of fascists, homophobes, biphobes, racists and misogynists pretending to be feminists, a group that likes to label themselves gender critical, has been chipping away at trans rights in the UK, as well as trying to prevent further provisions. Now, in order to achieve this, the so-called gender-critical camp has been propagating a number of myths, such as the idea that trans women pose a threat to cis women, something far-right groups later admitted they'd made up, stating that, quote, Our side concocted the bathroom safety male predator argument as a way to avoid an uncomfortable battle over LGBT ideology and still fire up people's emotions, end quote. Another popular myth spouted is the idea that the trans cult is indoctrinating young people and turning them transgender, typically focusing on trans men. A common practice in this regard is to show photos of minors prior to going through their medical confirmation and post, remarking about how they're lost potential, sexually. That they should have just been a butch lesbian, irrespective of the sexuality of the person in question, since gay, bisexual, and ace trans men do exist. This sense of sexual entitlement among gender critical folk mirroring that seen in cishet men towards non heterosexual women. A myth that doesn't add up with the evidence in how the vast majority of youth refer to gender identity clinics, clinics which take the child led gender affirmative approach, de cis without seeking further support. Because if there really was a trans cult at work here, we'd expect to see most, if not all the said people, go on to receive medical support. The truth, meanwhile, is simple. There are key, observable differences between trans youth and youth simply exploring who they are. Differences professionals can use to guide teens down the path, best suited to meeting their needs and ensuring their well-being. That's why those that remain and are started on puberty blockers, a fully reversible medication used to delay puberty to offer the individual more time to arrive at the right conclusion, have a 100% persistence rate with the individual going on to pursue HRT or confirmation surgery. It's not because of some fictional cabal, it's because our systems are so cautious that they filter out those simply exploring who they are. However, recent reports show this lie to be based in projection, with gender criticals claiming their targets are guilty of what they themselves do. Enter Amy Dias, former member of the gender critical cult, and that's a word she herself uses. In an interview conducted by Pink News journalist Vic Parsons, Amy Dias laid out some of the many ways that she was groomed, stripped of her autonomy, and even had her abuse ignored by the very people claiming to care about her as a lesbian. She talks about the way in which, as she was first becoming aware of the gender-critical cult, she was approached by a series of well-known names who constantly checked in and fed her this narrative that lesbians were under attack by trans people. Now, Dias talks about the fact that, at the time all this was happening, she was in a vulnerable state. She lost her job and her home, and was living out of her car, something which understandably had a profound impact on her mental state. To quote, For the first time, Amy's voice breaks a little as she recounts what this period of her life was like. I felt like everybody knew, and they just would exploit. Instead of helping, they would just keep taking from you. They wanted you to be unstable. She pauses. That's something I noticed. It was at this point that the emotional and sexual abuse she experienced at the hands of the gender critical movement was at its worst, Amy says. Another pause. The more stabilised I got, the less they could control me. And they try to control you. That's where the struggle started. It's harder for you to see things and process things when you're working to pay your bills and survive, end quote. There was also a lot of covering up for abusers. In fact, it seems that the whole topic of female-led abuse was deemed off-limits, seemingly because it challenged the myth of the trans predator. Or as the article states, quote, 
Amy, herself a survivor of sexual violence perpetuated by a woman, wanted this issue to be part of the discussion, but she was repeatedly shut down. When I talked about it to any gender-critical feminist, they would downplay it and say, well, it's not as bad as with men, or we want to focus on men, she says. The gender-critical movement, Amy says, is covering for abuse. I call them the matriarchy. They cover for abuse of women, right and left, no matter what it is. They won't let lesbians discuss issues that matter to us. Like, that's a lesbian community issue, and they get so defensive and mad when you try to talk about it. It's like women can do no wrong. Basically, they wrote us into this thing just to use us. So they could say, we've got lesbians on our side, and then they're hurting us. End quote. Now, the article also goes on to discuss said group's association with fascism and conservative Christianity, something that's being covered extensively on this channel, though I would suggest you go read the original article. I don't want to quote too much of it, as that would be unfair to Vic. However, I did want to bring this news to you, as well as discuss some things that have happened since the article, and my thoughts on how to proceed. Starting with the way in which Julie Bindle came forward and declared herself as the person who groomed Dias at the start, going so far as to try and get her to move to the UK so Dias could be controlled easier. Now, of course, she does this in the most mocking fashion, in line with what we come to expect from many abusers. However, what's really interesting is that she's begun throwing around threats of legal action, in spite of the fact that the article never names who it's talking about. My bet was split between professional abuser Julia Long and stalker Venice Allen. So it's not like you can read the article and go, that's Julia Bindle. So it would be an interesting case to see go to court. Of course, we have £1,989.78 in the anti-trans slap fund. Though I doubt it will ever make it that far, though it's worth noting in case it does. Fact is, all this comes out during a time where things continue to seemingly get worse for trans people in the UK, thanks to the rhetoric created by the gender-critical cult. Liz Truss, Tory MP and current Minister for Women and Equalities, has made a series of threats of legislative violence towards the trans community in line with gender-critical doctrine. In actions that mirror fascist groups around the globe, Liz Truss is seemingly seizing on the ongoing pandemic as a time to forward plans to strip back the already limited rights of trans folk down to the bone, an act that has been condemned by every major political party, even the Tories' own LGBT plus group, not to forget tens of thousands of individuals. And whilst Truss is being deliberately vague on the details, from what she has stated, we get the sense that her plan revolves around removing trans protections covered by the Equality Act of 2010, as well as blocking healthcare for trans youth, actions which have been compared to Margaret Thatcher's horrific Section 28. And that's not the only comparison that can be noted. As well as adopting the rhetoric of the gender-critical cult, Liz Truss seems to be taking a leaf from open American fascism in rebranding atrocity as freedom. Liz Truss has made clear her desire to abolish the Women's and Equalities Office, wanting to replace it with the Ministry of Freedom in an absolutely brazen attempt at doublethink. Why? Well, her reasons are rather simple. Liz Truss believes that the Equalities Office has been overtaken by attempts to uphold the rights of marginalised communities, or identity politics as she calls it, the very thing the office was founded for. Her language here reflects groups like the American Freedom Party and the American Heritage Foundation. When Liz Truss talks about freedom, she means the freedom to continue to target and enact violence on marginalised folk, something we cannot ignore, just like we can't ignore where she's sourcing this rhetoric from. Again, all of this is happening during the ongoing pandemic, limiting what human rights advocates can do to protest Truss's statements. Not to mention it only adds to the shared trauma we're all going through at the moment. There is no doubt in my mind that even if Truss has shut down on this, that there has likely already been a cost in trans lives over the whole ordeal. Because when you take a marginalised community, put them under a high-pressure situation like a global pandemic, 
and then start threatening to strip back their rights. That is going to be the last straw for some people, and we will likely never know the true cost of Truss's actions as it will be lost among the thousands of others who are dying thanks to our maliciously inept government. I see people going around commenting on how gender critical folk are unhappy that the current crisis isn't turning into a trans killer in the same way that HIV was for the early queer community. But the fact is, that's just not true. Transphobic governments around the globe are seizing the opportunity to do as much damage to our communities as possible since it makes protesting said actions difficult. Not to forget that most people are justifiably distracted by other issues. And the gender critical cult is directly responsible for that in the UK. So far I've been focusing mostly on the anti-trans element to the misnomer radical feminism, but there is another common trait shared by many in the gender critical crowd, and that is their disdain for sex workers. Following Dice's article, Kelly Lawrence, a former sex worker and sexual violence survivor, came forward and shared a very similar case relating to sex worker rights. She discussed the way that there was no empathy in the movement for sex workers, how those hurt by things such as the Nordic model, which increases the risk involved with sex work, are seen as collateral damage for shutting down the industry. Lawrence also discusses the way in which she received abuse following her departure, stating that quote, a week after the event, I had declared my stance against the Nordic model. A few weeks later, I was out of the Radfair movement for good, driven finally away by the incessant mocking of trans women and by a friend telling me that all men are the enemy and that my three-year-old son will grow up to abuse women. When I protested, I was again accused of, surprise, surprise, false consciousness. When I complained about the bullying of trans women, I was told I had to unpack my conditioning to be nice and pander to the patriarchy. These are brainwashing tactics, pure and simple, and I had finally realized this. There is another indication of cult-like status, and that is the vilification of members who leave, especially if they do so publicly. Over the past few weeks, I've been relentlessly trolled and found defamatory discussions about myself on gender-critical threads on Reddit and Mumsnet. Yesterday, I was sent rape porn by a rad femme who told me this is what you are promoting and that I had betrayed the movement and all women. I am openly a sexual violence survivor and the clip triggered a PTSD attack. It was almost enough to make me shut up. Almost, but not quite. End quote. Now that last bit is really horrific. As a survivor of child rape inside a domestic violence refuge who has been hospitalized following a particularly vicious panic attack, I can't comprehend the malice behind the person who actively tried to do this. It reminds me a lot of when US politician journalist Kurt Eichenwald was sent a GIF image with the intent to cause a seizure for publishing comments critical of Donald Trump, which it inevitably did. Now even though this happened in December of 2016, the case only made it to court in December of 2019. However, I just wanted to raise the comparison to point out that what was done to you could be argued to be aggravated assault. It's not a fucking joke. But this shows the extent to which self-declared radfems and members of the gender-critical slash anti-sex work cult will go to try and silence people who have escaped them. And I don't see this sort of event stopping anytime soon as only more people are going to become aware of these things. But it also makes me wonder how many people escape these cults yet are afraid to come forward on account of how they'll be targeted. There's a very clear reason behind why they do it and that's to stop any sort of scrutiny being directed towards them and their doctrine. Coming to a close, there's one thing I'd like to discuss quickly and that's my thoughts on Amy Dias and her journey. I can't really speak on Kelly Lawrence in this way on account of the fact that I'm not a sex worker, but I do have some concerns when it comes to Amy Dias. Whilst I've gone ahead and unblocked her and we now mutually follow one another, 
I'm still hesitant to give her the all clear on account of the fact that I've dealt with these sorts of situations before and I've seen relapses. It'll take me a while to monitor her improvement to finally reach a point where I'm satisfied that any residual transphobia has dried up. And I think it's right to be cautious. I also think it's important for people out there discussing the issue to note that suspicion is not unreasonable, as I feel a lot of the discussion so far is very ahead in its assumptions, leaving some trans people with the impression that maybe they're slightly paranoid. So I just wanted to acknowledge the concerns I still have in hopes that it puts you at ease about your own. I'm cautiously hopeful for the article that should be coming out the same weekend as this video, but I don't want to put all of my hopes into it. Though, if you're watching this Amy, please don't be discouraged by the suspicion. There are a lot of people who are exhausted with what's been happening the past several years. People who have been hurt in many ways. And that makes some of us slow to trust others. Your progress in challenging the mindset you had pushed on you, whilst at your lowest, is admirable. And I genuinely do have hope for the future. So I'd personally like to thank you for your insight into what's going on in the gender critical crowd, and wish you all the best in future ventures. Now if you appreciate what myself and Adita do here on the channel in fighting back against misinformation, do know that you can support us on Patreon. Your support gives us the funds to keep going and to keep putting out videos involving this level of research. You can also check out our other videos to see more of what we have to offer. So with that said, we'd just like to thank our Patreon sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soraya and Katie, Garrett Van Voorst, Chelsea Williams, Doyle Jackson, Wellington Marcus, Sosh Daniels, Justin Allen, and Atlas Five. And for myself and Adita, take care now.